I begin with the greeting words of paradise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, it is a pleasure and a great opportunity for me to be with you tonight and to be able to address you on this very important topic. And I pray that the few moments that we spend together tonight would be a source of understanding, a source of unity, and inshallah, a means that we can share with each other some of what we have learned and some of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped us to experience in our lives as Muslims. Islam and Muslims today, or should I say the Muslims, not so much Islam today, are really in a great crisis. And I believe that we are at a crossroads. It is important for us to be able to look at our situation in a holistic fashion. In order for us to be able to do this, we should be able to look into the past, reflect on the, on the present, and then project along with our dua into the future. Muslims today make up close to 25% of the Earth's population. We live at strategic points throughout the globe, on the waterways, on the coastlines of the world. We sit upon over 40 to 50 percent of the mineral wealth of the human race. If you were to take a look at the top 10 rich people on earth, you would probably find that the majority of the top 10 are Muslims. They say the Sultan of Brunei in Southeast Asia may be the richest individual on the face of the planet Earth. We have armies. We have thousands of intellectuals. We have modern technology. We have great potentialities. But at the same time, we have one of the largest refugee populations in the world. At the same time, in some parts of the world, Muslims are throwing food away. And close to them, Muslims are starving to death. We have great military potentiality, but yet we suffer through Bosnia Herzegovina, where thousands of Muslims are killed, thousands of Muslim women are raped, and the Muslim world looks on. And so we are living with glaring contradictions. And it is like the body of Islam is like a huge facade or a huge structure in front of us. But the structure needs energy. It's like a machine that doesn't have the oil in it to make it run. The parts are all there. The outside surface is there. The structure appears to be there, but the energy, the fuel that makes it go, is missing. And so I believe that we should reflect upon our situation reflect upon what came before us and sincerely turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to help us to make the right decisions. Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him in the last year of his life before he left his companions delivered to them the Mount Arafat sermon and in this sermon he made it clear to them that there is nothing worthy of worship but Allah. He also made it clear to them that we should not oppress anybody. Do not oppress anybody so that you in turn would not be oppressed. He stressed to the believers economic purity. That all those deals based upon riba, interest, usury, these should be done away with that we should deal with each other and the rest of humanity in economic purity. He stressed clearly to the believers that there is no preference of the Arab over the non-Arab, or the non-Arab over the Arab. There is no preference of white over black, or black over white, except with taqwa, except that the piety, righteous action is what distinguishes the believers. 
He made it clear that men have rights over women, but women also have rights over men. He told us through his Sahaba that there are two things. If you follow them, you will never go astray. That is the book of Allah and his Sunnah. And he charged them with the responsibility of taking this message to the rest of humanity. And so the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, left out of the Hijaz area, left the Arabian Peninsula, and spread out in different directions. And the majority of them died outside of the Hijaz area. And it is recorded that Uqba ibn Nafi' radiallahu an, one of the Sahaba, rode across North Africa in, in the spreading and defense of Islam, rode his horse into the Atlantic, and looked across and said, if I knew there were lands across you, I would take these lands for Allah. I would spread the message of Islam in that direction. Approximately 711, Tariq ibn Ziyad, rahimahullah, crossed the straits, what we call Gibraltar, and Muslims entered in, liberating the land from tyranny, entered into the land and stayed there for almost 781 years. And Tariq landed on the Jebel, Jebel Tariq, that is known to us today as Gibraltar. The Muslims brought along with them civilization. Because Islam not only deals with the theoretical aspects of life, but also the practical aspects. And so they found the land fair seeming for the planting of citrus fruits. And they planted lemons and grapefruits and limes and oranges. And the word in Arabic for orange is burtaqal. Ard al It was like the land of the oranges that grew so well. And burtaqal became Portugal. They went to the north in the Russian states and they found a land that you needed to have a lot of sabr, a lot of patience to live in this land. And so it became Ard al-Sabr, Sabriya. And this we know today as Siberia. They went south, down past the Red Sea, into the ocean on East Africa. And they found that the Persians had had a base in East Africa, and they called it Maqad al-Sha'. And now we know it as Mogadishu. Musa ibn Baig, rahimahullah, founded a base on the East African coast. And so Musa ibn Baig's place is known as Mozambique. They went into the ocean and they found the wind blowing and they found rain coming in large numbers. So this mosim of rain or season of rain became the monsoons. They went into the Pacific and contrary to the little bit of knowledge that we understand about our own presence in this part of the world, Muslims went into the Pacific Ocean during the Umayyad period. And that we trace as oh, that, that within a hundred years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, they went into that region and they found a set of islands and it was a windy area. So he said, Juzul Hawa, there's a lot of Hawa, air, wind. And so Juzul Hawa becomes Hawaii. They travel to parts of the world that you may not be aware of. And one could ask, how could a man coming from the Arabs, who at that, who at that time treasured their language, but did not treasure technology, how could they have done this? But we recognize that the dark ages, so-called dark ages of Europe, when the lights went off, went off after the, the fall of the Roman Empire, this was the golden age of Islam. And Muslims between the 8th century to the 14th, 15th century excelled in all of the disciplines that we now bow down to the West. And we study and we come to the University of Miami and Loyola and Harvard University in London and we thank our professor because he teaches us something about math, but sifr is an Arabic word, zero. The number system we count is the Arabic numeral system. The basis of the computer age 
was started by Muslims. Al-Jabra is from Jabar. This is an Arabic word. And you can go on into trigonometry, trigonometry, calculus, many of the disciplines, and you will find that the Muslims were actually ones who laid the foundation for this civilization. Alchemia, alchemy, chemistry. We led the world in that area. Astronomy, maps of visible stars, correcting the sun and moon tables, the first use of the pendulum to measure tables, the first to build observatories, predicted sunspots, eclipses, and the appearance of comets. Optics, leading the world. Medicine, al-qanun fit tib, the law of medicine being used by Europe up until the 17th, 18th century. And we can continue on and on and on and show the great advancements made by Muslims in all disciplines. And especially our ability to map the world, our natural ability to think about direction. Every time we make salat, we think about direction. And so it was a natural thing for Muslims to go out and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, travel in the earth. See what became of those who came before you. And so we went into the Pacific. And a Harvard University study done by a man named Barry Fell is called Saga America, which you may be able to get in your library, although historians have waged war against his work to the point where he had to put it underground. He was a person who translates different languages. And so they found the writings of many different peoples in America, in pictographs. They found it in caves. They found it in different rocks, different parts of America. And a type of scribbling, which they thought was the scribbling of the native people, Barry Fell and his team came to find out that it was actually the combination of an ancient Libyan script and Kufic Arabic. He took this proof to Benghazi, Libya, in Tripoli, Libya, and he brought scholars, UNESCO scholars, Arabic-speaking scholars, to America to investigate the information. And startling proof of Islamic presence in the Southwest, in California, came to light. They found an engraving in Nevada, in a bedrock, huge bedrock, saying, Ismullah, the name of Allah. They found a 7th century Kufic uh, writing on uh, the boundary peak and the border of Nevada and California saying Shaitan is the fountain of lies. They found Muhammad, Nabiullah, alayhi salatu wasalam. They found this, this writing all over the Southwest and they realized that the native people, especially the rock dwelling people, who made their structures built into the side of mountains, that the configuration of their houses is the same configuration as the Bedouins, as the people living in southern Algeria and Libya and Morocco. They found the clothing, designs on the clothing, tattoos on the faces, a number of cultural realities of the people living in the southwest were the same as Muslims living in North Africa. And they found a map, an 8th century map, and that is where they found Juzr al-Hawa. And the map showed the Hudson Bay. It showed Panama. It clearly showed that Muslims came across and were actually mapping the United States, Mexico, down into Central America. On the eastern side, proof has come to us through al-Mas'udi, a famous geographer in Muruj al-Dahab written approximately 956 AD, where he spoke of the journey of a man named Khashkhas ibn Sa'id, who came into, who went into the, the, the Sea of Darkness, the Atlantic, and came back with treasure, and everybody in Andalusia knew about the journey of Khashkhas. This is what Mas'udi writes in his book, which is still in the library. Al-Idrisi, in the 10th, in the 12th century, in his geography book, wrote about the, the, the journey of Magharibah, these seafaring North African Andalusians who went into the ocean and found a set of islands 
went to another set, were captured, blindfolded, and the king on the islands spoke to them through an interpreter who spoke Arabic. This is in the 12th century. And he told them about their position and about how long it would take to get back home. The most startling of these many reports, and I'm only bringing you a few, but probably the most startling is in Al-Umari. Masalak al-Abra fi mamalak al-Amsar. This is a geography book which shows the journey of different travelers into the different kingdoms uh, of the earth. And in it, it speaks about the journey of Mansa Musa, a West African Islamic ruler, who in approximately the year 1324 made pilgrimage to Mecca. And Amir Mansa Musa carried with him 72,000 followers. Can you imagine this? 72,000 people crossed the Sahara Desert. They carried so much gold with them that they changed the economy of every country that they reached. When they came into Egypt, Ibn Amir Hajib, the reporter of, of Al Umari, said to them, where did you get this power and authority from? And he said, I come from a lineage of kings in Mali. And my predecessor, Abu Bakr, went into the Atlantic with 2,000 ships, and he never returned. These people are known as Mandinka, the Mande speaking. We say Mandingo in the Americas, the Mandingos. And they crossed from the Guinea coast of West Africa using the currents. And if you look at a map, you will see the closeness between the West African coast and Brazil. And the currents go right into it. And a Scandinavian uh, scientist, Thor Heyerdahl, in the 60s took a boat and he went across by himself in a boat made of papyrus and he showed that you can get across the Atlantic uh, with a boat made of indigenous African materials and you don't have to be on, on, on the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria of Christopher Columbus. Because Columbus, we know, was lost. And they found him around 1492. And so the Mandinka Muslims went across and writings were found on the Amazon. All along the Amazon, mounds were found with Mandinka writing, talking about their journey and how they went along the Amazon into Central America, into the southwest of the United States, and Leo Weiner in his book, Africa and the Discovery of America, another Harvard University scholar, came forth with proof to show that these African Muslims came into the United States and actually were in the Southwest and the mounds in the Southwest are showing elephants. And they said the desert is hot, the birds are numerous. The elephants are tired. And they went up the Mississippi. And Leo Weiner showed that they actually made contact with the native people and they came in contact with the Algonquin and Iroquois nation. And they mixed with the native inhabitants of this part of the world. And so the journeys of the Muslims came a, continued. But because they were not able to establish themselves, because they were not able to keep the link with the rest of the Muslim world, the link with the knowledge, making Islam relevant to the world that they lived in, and then the conquest of the Spanish conquistadores, when they came in and destroyed all forms of culture that they found. Because of this, we have no traces of them except for these few writings of the scholars. And now it is being unearthed, the writings in different parts of America. And so when you look back at what happened in Al-Andalusia, you're amazed. It's an amazing time. And we need to study that time seriously. <coughs> because the Muslims had reached the height of power and authority. And in Cordoba, in Cordoba, Medina al Zahra, the Khalif al Mansur had built this beautiful city and this dazzling uh, structures that when the European kings came, they would be dazzled by the sight that they saw in front of them. But the Muslims then, when Hayat al-Dunya, the life of this world, came into their hands, and then they forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and corruption set in, tribalism, Arab versus Berber, versus African, versus Persian, 
versus European. People starting to look at each other, not as believers, but as nation groups or, or tribal groups or color groups. Or your Amir, when Ibn Battuta, Rahimahullah, the traveler, goes into Andalusia, he and other travelers, they said, I have never seen, or we have never seen so many Amir al Mu'minins in one place. Everybody thinks he's the Amir. And one Amir fights against the other one. And he goes to the Christian conquistadores and say, you come with me and we fight these uh, Muslims. Maybe he said these fundamentalists. We fight these Muslims. They're no good. And so they say, yes, yes, we will make a treaty with you. And they destroy the other Muslim and then they kill the first one. And so they conquered the territory until the time of 1492. Abu Abdullah, the last ruler in Granada, Granada, surrendered. He surrendered with the understanding that no Muslim house would be entered into by the Christian forces. That Muslims would be able to continue Jumu'ah, continue their, their madrasas, maintain their culture, maintain their traditions, but they would have to pay taxes to the king and queen. And the Christians agreed, and within 20 years, they had destroyed almost all of the masjids, desecrated the houses, raped the women, and they began the Inquisition. And the Inquisition was a time, a terrible time for Muslims, that when you, that you would be questioned, they'd take a Muslim or a Jew, and they say, are you a Catholic? And they'd take you in front of the Inquisitor. And if you're strong enough, to resist, and you say, no, I'm a Muslim, they burn you at the stake. And so 500,000 or more Muslims and Jews, other people refused, had to run, had to flee. Muslims going back to the lands of Islam, making the hijrah, to the lands of Muslims. Other people who could not escape and couldn't take the torture hid their identity. And the Jews were called Morenos, Muslims Morescos. And so these people were the labor force that came across with the Spanish and the Portuguese. And they came into this part of the world in large numbers. And unfortunately, the history books do not tell us of the presence of Muslims. You think Muslims came only recently. They want to call you an alien or a new immigrant. But actually, we came across before Columbus, and then we came along with the Spanish and the Portuguese. And the records clearly show that Columbus himself, when he traveled into the Caribbean, and he was off the island of Jamaica, he found a ship in his records. The ship was 40 feet long, with a diameter of 8 feet, had a shaded pavilion in the center, and from a distance, Columbus thought it was like what they call Moorish galleys, the Muslim boats that they used to see in the Mediterranean. And when they came close, they found approximately 40 men and women. And unlike the Jamaican Indians, the, the men were wearing these sleeveless shirts with different colors and designs like the Muslims used to wear. And the women had veils across their faces. Columbus reported this. His son, Ferdinand, also spoke about black people that they found all over the Caribbean. These are called black Caribs. And there's a struggle going down right now for their identity to be recognized by Caribbean people. They found them in Honduras. They found them in Panama, all throughout the Caribbean. And these people more than likely were the descendants of the early Mandinka Muslims who came across from West Africa. They call themselves now Garifuna the Garifuna people. And you find them in Dominica, the island of Dominica, in St. Vincent, in Belize, all along the Caribbean coastline of Central America. And alhamdulillah, many of them are now entering into Islam. In 1527, again, the Muslims working for the Spanish, as in Mori, a Moroccan Berber, was a great explorer. And it is reported that 
a group was sent out from Florida, from Florida, and, and we aren't even taught this in the history books. A group was sent out, 300 Spaniards, which included this Muslim, and they went from Florida to the West Coast and back to Texas. Only three people, along with Azenmori, survived. The rest were killed by the natives. And it is reported that he was the first person, the first explorer, to enter into the Pueblo Indian villages. But they wipe him out of the history book. And he was the one that led the conquistadores across to help them understand what actually existed in the Southwest. They also, when they tell you the founding of this country, they tell you about Jamestown. And you think that the country was founded with the British in Jamestown, but we know that the conquistadores, the Spanish, were here before the British. And they established St. Helena in South Carolina, 1566. And it was overrun by the British. And records are now showing that there were hundreds of these Muslim Morescos who were living in St. Helena, and instead of submitting to the British, they went into the interior, and they mixed with the native people, all in the Carolina areas, intermarried with the people, and they settled into the interior. In 1586, the English pirate, Sir Francis Drake, commanded 30 English ships, and they made a daring raid on Brazil, and they liberated 400 Portuguese and Spanish prisoners. Amongst them is reported that 300 or more were Muslims, Morescos. Francis Drake carry, carried his ships to America, and history also tells us that 200 of these people were left on the shore, and the British uh, citizens who wanted to return, they were tired of America, they wanted to return, they went with Francis Drake, and these people landed in America, went up into the mountains, and they met the other, the other ones. These Morescos are now, they are called Melungeons. And they met uh, this other group, and they settled, and they intermingled with the native populations living in the Carolinas, living in Georgia, all in the interior area. And they called themselves Portuguese. Anytime you see them, they will call themselves Portuguese. We used to say Geechee. So if you have, you Afro-American, part of my family, maybe many people, you have somebody in your family say, you light-skinned Geechee. Okay, it's like, a, it, this is a group of people that was known, that's known in America, especially in the South. They're known. But where did they come from? A startling uh, research just done within the last few years by Brent Kennedy, who was one of these Melungeons. He found out he had this disease, sarcoidosis, a terrible disease. And when he checked out this disease, he found out that the only people who have this disease are the people who live along the Mediterranean. The Spanish, the Portuguese, Sicilians, uh, Moroccans, Libyans, Turkish. These are the people who have this disease. And they checked it genetically to these groups. And so when he checked out history more, and he was given a grant to check out history, he found out that in the mid-1600s, there were people living amongst the Powhatans and related tribes of Eastern Virginia and North Carolina who were described as dark like Indians, but called Portuguese. The similar people in, in South Carolina called themselves Turks. The early 17th century Powhatan Indian description of heaven is nearly word for word like the description found in the Quran itself. In 1784, Tennessee Governor John Sivier records an encounter with people in the western North Carolina with dark skin, reddish brown complexions. They were supposed to be of Moorish descent, he said, of Moorish descent. In eastern uh, Tennessee in the late 1700s, Jonathan Swift, an English man, married a Melungeon woman and utilized Melungeon men in his own silver mining operation. And his dark-skinned companions were known as Mecca Indians. And when they described these people, they described, they said these people were really good with silver crafts. They were crafts, and this is what coming out of Spain, the Muslims were the crafts artisans. They were really good artisans, 
And they said they used to fall down in prayer on the ground a number of times during the day facing east. This is in America. And Qurans have been found, information has been found. It's being unearthed to show the presence of these people. And so, to come to a conclusion, what is now coming to the surface is that anybody coming from the southeastern part of the United States, whether you consider yourself white, black, Portuguese, Geechee, mixed, Indian, whatever you think you are, that if your name, if your last name, and there's a lot of names, but the most famous ones, if your last name is Adams, Adkins, Bell, Bennett, Berry, Bowling, Chavis, Coleman, Collins, Gibson, Goins, Hall, Jackson, Lopez, Moore, um, Mullins, Nash, Robinson, Sexton, and Williams. If you have any one of those names, then more than likely you're a Melungeon. This is crucial information. This is white Americans too. So what that means is that these people are tied into Muslims, that in their background are Morescos, Melungeons coming out of Spain, hiding their identity and becoming part of America. And proof has come to us that Nancy Hanks, the mother of Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, was a Melungeon. That is definite. And so you may be saying the President of the United States was a Muslim. Or you got a Muslim family. Abraham Lincoln. This is critical information, which is now being um, put together and coming to the light. In the slavery period, especially when the British then began to bring slaves in, they tried first with the poor white working class. That didn't work, because they saw themselves as the master. They tried with the native people. That didn't work either because this was their land, so they would die, sit there and die, or they run away. Then they went to Africa, trying to isolate a people whose territory was similar to the territory of the coastline, who had physical strength, had good agricultural skills, who they could isolate, and then by making color codes, could make slavery into a color issue, and then brought them into the United States really as captured prisoners of war. Slave, slave is the wrong terminology. Really are captured prisoners of war. But actually they say, we are realizing now through uh, documented research that over 30% of the slaves or the captured prisoners of war coming into the United States were Muslims. They brought with them the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. Qurans are now being unearthed, written by the slaves during that period. Saleh Bilali, Bilali Muhammad, Ayub ibn Sulaiman, Abdurrahman, and a number of names you will find being recorded and the narratives now coming to the surface of this period of history and the position of the, 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 the Muslims who led revolts all over the Americas. And we don't have time tonight but in Suriname, in Jamaica, in Haiti, in Trinidad, in many parts of the Caribbean, the Muslims led slave revolts. In Jamaica, they were passing around a document in Arabic calling for jihad, in Arabic. And after that, in 1834, a slave revolt broke out in, in the parish or the province or state of Manchester. But father was separated from mother. It was prohibited to fast in the month of Ramadan. In most cases, if they found you praying or fasting or speaking Arabic, they'd kill you. They'd torture you and kill you publicly. The names were taken away. The culture was taken away. But there are many families who have a relative who remember something. Something was there that they weren't Christians. There's something different about their society. And it passed down. So we find in the 30s, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, most of the leaders of, of the proto-Islamic groups, those groups coming up 
either practicing Islam or some version of Islam, most of the leaders came from Georgia or the Carolinas, right out of the same area that the Muslims were uh, located in in large numbers. Economic migration. Muslims came from the Ottoman Empire. And so we find 19th, 20th century presence of Muslims from Turkey, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Lebanon, Syria, coming out of the Ottoman Empire and settling in the interior of America along with the settlers, forming part of America. But because Muslims were not able to establish Islam to make it relevant to the situation they are living in, in actuality. They couldn't pass it down. So now all you have left in, in most cases is just a town. Quran, Louisiana. Mecca, California. We went to Mecca, California and we found beautiful dates like the dates of Iraq, dates of Medina. Beautiful dates. The town was called Mecca, California. Houses looked like they were built by Muslims. Where are the Muslims? They're gone. All over America there's places like this. But when we become weak in our faith, we cannot establish the deen properly and make it relevant, then Muhammad becomes Mo. Bilal becomes Billy. Yahya becomes Johnny. The names get lost. Next generation, he knows his father as Billy. Doesn't know what Bilal means. And so he relates as his name, Johnny, or whatever it is, and gets lost in the melting pot of America. And so our communities are growing. And alhamdulillah, in the past 30 years, Islam has grown with leaps and bounds in the Americas. By the year 2000, inshallah, we would be clearly the second largest faith group in North America. If you separate the Christians, the Catholics, and Protestants, we'll be the largest. And in terms of our numbers, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of babies practicing the sunnah. We have people coming into Islam, alhamdulillah, by sheer numbers alone, if we practice our Islam and hold on to the rope, that we would be a significant force in the Americas. But the new strategy with Muslims is not just divide and conquer. That's being used against us. But the new strategy is also confuse and conquer. Bring a form of Islam you hear the name, you hear assalamu alaikum, but the things they're doing are so foreign from the message, you get confused. You don't know which way to go. You don't know what religion that they're really talking about in the name of Islam. And so confuse and conquer. Also, in the Islamic centers, neutralize the leadership. Muslims fighting each other over trivial issues, ego personalities, leadership fixed in stone to such an extent you can't change the leadership unless you have a coup d'etat. <laughs> and they end up in court fighting each other and asking the disbeliever, can you make judgment between us? Can you make a judgment between us? And the disbeliever looks at these people, are you crazy? But I'll take your money. The lawyers love the money, and they take it. And this is happening all over the place, having building structures, but no life inside of it. Have the name of Muslims, but no relevant dawah, no spreading of the message. You eat halal food, you drink halal drinks, you're a Muslim inside of your house, but when we come out in the street, we shed our Islam and become part of American society. Not that we should leave American society, but we should be part of American society clearly as Muslims. That the society would have alternatives to the situations that we are facing. And so in a nutshell, I want to look at some of these problems. 
Some of the challenges we are facing is our respect and our spread of pure Islamic knowledge. It is crucial for us now, all Muslims, to go back to authentic sources that when we are making our judgments, when we are dealing Islamically, we should try the best that we can to be using the Quran, the Sunnah, the sayings of the scholars as a basis of how we are functioning, to give us the consciousness to make the decisions in the things that we are doing. There's a problem that I call Islam versus culture. That sometimes the culture of the people, whether it be outside of America or American culture, clashes with Islam. And many of us learned Islam from our parents. And so we say, well, that's what they do uh, in our country. Uh, we pray like this, or we, we, we don't marry those people over there because we live in the mountain, they live down by the river. We don't marry those people. You can't marry them. You know, a sister came to me, and she said, I am from what is called the Ashraf, the Sharif people, they're the noble people, descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And as all Muslims, we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. We send peace and blessings to Muhammad and his family. That is the duty of a Muslim to do every time you pray. But there's a concept going around amongst us that divides us into groups or castes. The sister asked me in all sincerity that I am a girl who is supposed to be Sharif and is it permissible for a Sharif girl to marry a common Muslim? That's what she asked me. So I said, wait a minute. Are we Hindus or Muslims? The Hindus have the Brahmins, upper caste, they have other different castes, Shudra, untouchable people. So uh, is this a caste or is this Islam? So what is stopping you when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Akramakum and Allahi atqaqum that the most beloved to Allah is the one that got the taqwa, not the blood in your veins. Because if Hashimi blood was enough, then Abu Lahab in your Quran, Tabat Yada Bilab Watab, the father of the flames, was Hashimi with the best of the bloods. And he's burning in hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his punishment in the Quran. And his blood couldn't help him. And so we have to come off this understanding. These, these things that divide us, one group and another group. And in each country, you can go country to country. And in America, you, you might not know this, some of the brothers and sisters, we got our own problem too. We got our problem, a southern brother or northern city boy, country boy. We were overseas fighting with each other because these brothers are the city slickers. And other brothers from the south, man, you all are too slow. You don't think right. The southern brothers, we're stable, firm. You people are too flighty, man. You're just out in space. And so the clash came. We got our own problems here that we got to drop amongst ourselves. Culture. Recently, a family came to me. This is a reality situation. They came and they said that we're going to get married. We, we wanted to marry our daughter and this man he came and he, he, he wanted to marry our daughter and he went to a magician. You start talking about magic around Muslims and everybody's eyes get big. <laughs> Talk about jinni going inside and we got to take it out. Okay, so he went to the magician and the magician said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get you married. And this is a true story. The names are being protected. <laughs> like to protect the innocent, as they used to say. The names will not be said. They went to the magician and he, he cut out the heart of a goat. And he wrapped it up with the girl's uh, clothing and her scarf and he buried it in a Christian graveyard. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. I don't know where his mind was at. Buried this stuff in the graveyard, did all kinds of things. And the foolish Muslims, they believed in this stuff. They believed in it. And then when he came, the family said, Brother Abdullah, we couldn't do anything. He came in with the magician, and then he said, I want to marry your daughter, and what do you say? And they said, our eyes were glued. All we could say is, yes, we do. Yes, take our daughter. The Muslim brother opens a restaurant, and in January, his business goes down, 
And he comes and he said, Brother Abdullah, they put the jinni, they went to the magician and he made a spell and he sent it across the ocean and they're on my restaurant. Take them off, brother. So I went in the middle of the restaurant, I said, there's a jinni in this place, come and get me right now. And the brother ran. <laughs> Nothing came. I said, brother, it's, it's, it's January, man. The people out there, they just finished Christmas. They don't have any money, man, so they're not coming to your restaurant. <laughs> it's not the jinni that's on top of you, okay? And I'm not saying to say the jinn do not exist. They do exist, but in most cases, it's superstition. It's the fear of the evil forces that we're so afraid of, instead of being afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba were afraid of nobody and nothing but Allah. And that is why Allah gave them victory and established Islam. Tribalism and nationalism, to an insane extent, moving amongst ourselves. We got to do something about this, seriously. Look into ourselves and maybe it's a blessing being in America. Because here, they're going to try to melt you down. You live with everybody else. Your culture's in trouble. But if your culture, the part that's un-Islamic, leave it. Keep the Islamic part. Stand by your principles of Islam. Too many times in our communities, the leaders are oppressors. Women are marginalized, taken out of Islamic activities. And brothers, and I'm sorry for being so straightforward, are spending so much time fighting a war to get the sisters not to be involved in Islamic activity. I don't know what religion you're talking about, man. The first person to accept Islam was a woman, Khadija radiallahu anha, and she confirmed Islam. The first person to die, shaheed for Islam, Sumeya radiallahu anha. The second most hadith is reported by a woman, Aisha radiallahu anha. And you can go on and see what is happening with the position of women in terms of Islam. So what is the sense in marginalizing women in our activities. Yes, we do not want to have the total ikhtilat mixing up and confusion going on in non-Muslim society. But in the Prophet's masjid, women were in the masjid. That is the authentic masjid of the Prophet That's the authentic masjid, okay? I'm gonna talk to you straight. Brothers, you want sunnah? Okay, but you use part of the hadith. You don't use the whole hadith. We were talking about the other day. They say, okay, sister, your home is better for you. That's true. But what about the first part of the hadith? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Oh, Don't prohibit women from coming to the masjid, but their home are better for them. And if there is a fitna, Yes, if there is trial, if there is a temptation, if there is danger in the street, then it is the right of the Imam to ask the women to stay home, to protect themselves. But when you're living in a situation, the sister comes to me and says, Brother Abdullah, can I go to the masjid? I said, Sister, do you go to the plaza? <laughs> yes, I go to the plaza. And sometimes the brother's in the plaza with the sister, it's also a prayer. Both people got to pray. She stays in the plaza with shaitan, and he goes to the house of Allah. What is this? Man? Why can't she pray in the masjid? Make a section for the sisters in the masjid. Look at the hadith really in truth, and you'll find that women came out to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Youth not being involved in our activities. The youth need to be involved not only in lip service, but need to be involved in the leadership. Because some of the decisions that we need to make, the youth have a feel for what is going on in this society that the older generation does not have. And this younger generation coming up here, they got another understanding, I'm telling you. And those of you who send your children to public school, you take one day off and sit in the class with your child, and you're gonna be shocked at what you see. They have another understanding 
and another struggle that they're going through, and so they should be included in the leadership. When you look at the Prophet Islam, you will find Abadullah al khams the five Abdullahis, like Abdullah ibn Abbas, ibn Umar, ibn Amr, ibn Mas'ud. You find these uh, uh, Abdullahis in the leadership. Ali ibn Abi Talib, karamallahu wajha, Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu an. You will find youth involved in the leadership. And so we need to include the youth in our leadership. Also, the danger of extremism. We need hikmah. And hikmah in Islam is wad'u shay fi mahali, putting things in the proper perspective. That's all it basically is in language. And it comes from your intelligence, from your understanding of Quran, applying it to the situation. This is what we need now, wisdom. The wisdom to understand how to apply Islam to this environment. This country is affecting all of the Muslim countries. It's affecting all of the Muslim countries. And if the people in this country can truly understand what Islam is, then we can influence the whole world from this point if it is done properly. But if we fight over petty issues and bicker amongst ourselves, then the people here will never follow us. They will not follow us. And maybe if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the message without us, as he promised, he could raise up a, a, a people who, who love Allah, he loves them, they are humble with the believers, and they are powerful in front of the disbelievers. And they're not ashamed of anybody blaming them about anything. They will stand up. That is the promise of Allah. And so we need to look seriously at ourselves. And two years ago, and I don't know what came out of this, a Buddhist monk in Japan accepted Islam. And when a leader accepts Islam in that part of the world, all of his followers go with him. Whatever the leaders do, they, they move in Jamaat. They had to put this brother underground. Islam is the second largest religion in Japan. If the Japanese accept Islam, they're going to turn us around. As our brother has said, we won't be late for any meetings that the Japanese are in charge of us. <laughs> We're going to be on time. Not uh, Florida time, or colored people's time, or Muslim time, or I don't know what it is you're going to call it. This funny kind of time where we're late, and I'm talking to myself too. The Japanese will get us together. And so we expect the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to try to do something with ourselves. Because Allah has clearly told us, in Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. He will not change our condition. And so our hearts, we got to start inside. I found this out in Ramadan. We formed a big uh, gathering of all the leaders. Ramadan was coming. And instead of saying the month of Ramadan, mashallah, we're saying, oh no. Another month, man, two Eids. You have that same problem here? Two Eids and oh, Ramadan. What is this, man? Everybody's angry because Ramadan's coming. Okay, so we formed a meeting, we sat down, and we said, is the problem ikhtilaf al matali? Is it difference in the horizons? No. The problem really was ikhtilaf al qulub It was the difference in the hearts. That's what the real problem is. People are hiding behind fiqh, hiding behind their school of thought. When the fuqaha, a imma of Islam, were teachers and students of each other, they were not like different religions. And the fiqh is easy if you sit down and, and, and come to a decision. We make it difficult. And so we need to clear up our hearts. Jealousy, hasad, it's in us. Somebody makes progress, other people start feeling jealous. We want to take it away from them. Prophet peace be said, Iyakum al hasad. Beware of hasad, jealousy. For inna al hasad yakul hasanati, kama ta'kulunar al hatab. 
Jealousy will eat up your good deeds like a fire eats up firewood. Kibriya takabbur, arrogance and pride. If you're proud of your body or proud of something physical about yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change you in a minute, can bring you low in an accident or a disease or take your life. We need to be humble and remember where we came from and where we are returning to. Riya, doing things to show off, to be seen by other people, not focusing clearly on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to repair our relationships. The leaders in Islamic history, from the time of the Prophet peace be upon him on, were the servants of the community. When the Prophet came into the room, they stood up, he said, sit down. Could you imagine this? Don't stand up for me. What is our leaders now? In the Muslim world, if the leader wants to go from his office to another office, the police are lying in the streets five hours before he leaves. You can only see him on television. They're afraid of the people. There's something wrong. They said when the Prophet, peace be upon him, they said that when people heard about him, his reputation, they trembled. But when they came near him, they never wanted to leave him. When they came into Medina, they looked at the halaqa, the circle, and they said, which one of you is Rasulullah They couldn't tell. He wasn't on a throne. A simple person. Don't follow me, worship Allah. Don't worship me. Don't, fo don't, don't be following me or, or like, like worship. If you really want to follow me, follow my sunnah. But don't make a god out of me. Don't go to the extremes in your understanding of me as the messenger of Allah The leadership, including the husband and the wife. If we are a mirror of our house, the man is the leader, that means he has leadership but not dictatorship. He needs to take shura, consultation with his wife. Because the Prophet peace be upon him said, La ta'a lil makhluq fi ma'siyatul khaliq. There is no obeying the creation. And the creation disobeys Allah. You don't have to obey them. That is the reality. And so our leadership is based upon our submission to Allah. Not on how much we terrorize people. Or we got money. Or some physical attribute. And so I humbly bring forward to you tonight that we are at a crossroads. Allah has given us potentialities. Allah has given us the truth in our hands. It only needs people now who are prepared to take this message, to drop tribal differences, jealousy, arrogance, separating each other based on school of thought, or an Islamic movement, or on your organization, whatever it may be, and come forward clearly and join hand with the believers. If we do not do this, then I fear for myself, and I fear for you. And I leave you with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he is telling us, Ummati hadihi ummatun marhuma, laysa alayha adabun fil akhirah, adabuha fid dunya, al fitna wa zalazul wal qatl. This my nation is one that has mercy on it. Its punishment is not in the next life. The punishment is in this life. Fitna, trials, tribulations, temptations, earthquakes, natural catastrophes. And you would be killed, you'd be murdered. That's a purification process that we are going through now. May Allah help us and unite us as believers and help us to humble ourselves only to Him and to be kind and gentle with each other and strong in the face of disbelief. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li walakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. We'll now open the floor to questions. We have half an hour. I'm sure there must be a lot of questions. It was a very interesting lecture, so um, please feel free to uh, 
stand up and address your questions. Do you have any paper in case the sister wants to write it down? Yes, brother. A question regarding the, um, you mentioned the names that they do business with the names of Collins, Stills, and Moore. Yeah. Um, what are the Islamic equivalents of those names, like the original group? The, it appears that the Melungeon people forced into the interior, first they, they, you know, they, they, they were forced to change their name to Portuguese names. So some of them are Portuguese based names, Goans and names like this. And they were also mixed with the native population and with the other, the British, French people, the other people, some of them mixed. And so they became all mixed up. But these are the names now that they're tracing through the lineages to the Melungeons in the southeastern part of the United States. And Brent Kennedy has a book called The Melungeons. And um, that book is actually on sale. If anybody's interested in the book, um, it is called The Melungeons. That's M E L U N G E O N S, The Resurrection of a Proud People. And it's published by Mercer University Press. 1994. That's in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. You can get the book, and it's an amazing book, and the work that is being done. The Melungeons, The Resurrection of a Proud People by Brent Kennedy. We are, there was brothers, and you know, when I gave this talk in, in New York City and in, in, parts, other city, in other places, brothers stood up and said, my name is Goins, man. And, you know, and, and one of them said his wife has got the disease, and she's a Muslim. And their family is definitely Melungeon family. So this, this is a very important uh, discovery for us in terms of uh, giving dawah to the people living here in America. The floor is open now for questions. Sisters, is also uh, permissible for you to ask a question if you want to. Yes, brother. Melungeon um, is M-E-L-U-N-G-E-O-N-S. Melungeons. And if anybody wants to get that information, you can uh, get it up here afterwards also. Yes, brother. Uh, sorry. Uh, son. Another, book, uh, another brother was here before. He mentioned Saga America. Yeah. This is by Barry Fell. F E L L. It's very difficult to get it. Very difficult. Because I went to uh, Walden, I think, and they told me it would be like yeah. three months if that's, you know. Now, what you have to do, you have to access one of the real big libraries, like University of Toronto Library is a massive library. So you gotta, you gotta access like a Columbia University or, I don't know, in, in, in down in Florida here, which, which university would be the biggest library here? Here in this university? Right, in Orangeville? Yeah, okay, get the one that has a real big library, otherwise you, maybe you can get it through the, um, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can apply for it, you know, through the library system. Barry Fell, F-E-L-L. Saga America. He has another book called America BC, but the one that, that, that interests us as Muslims is Saga America. It's an amazing find. The other, um, Leo Weiner. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't know about that one. Leo Weiner, Africa and the Discovery of America. Another book difficult to find, because what they do is liquidate the books, man. The, the ones that like, are against their scholarship. Ivan Van Sertima has done some good work from Rutgers University. Um, his, his books are pretty good too. He, he's balanced, he's not an insane Afrocentric. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. But Dr. Ben and them, he's not like that, man. He's not like that. Uh, Ivan Van Sertima. Van Sertima, S-E-R-T-I-M-A, African Presence in Early America. No, he's out to lunch, man. He's out to lunch, man. Floor is open for any questions. Everybody's hungry? The food is here, I think. Floor is open. Okay, number one, um, I'm originally from America, from Boston, but I, I live in Canada. 
So I use that as my first excuse um, to really, because this is really kind of a confusing issue, because uh, there's so many things involved in it at once. Okay, but um, I think from an Islamic point of view, really, um, Minister Farrakhan, um, although he has the ability to express himself clearer than almost anybody I've ever heard in English language. But whenever he speaks about Islam, it's totally confusing. It's, it's confusing. Because at some points it appears like, you know, he's saying he's a Muslim. Other points it appears like he's following what is known as the first resurrection of Elijah Muhammad. And that we know is clearly saying that Allah is a man, and that Elijah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And that we have gone past that stage now into the, the light of true Islam. And there's no need to go back into that. That was a phase. There's no need to go back into it. But it appears from what he's saying that that's really what his position is. And so based upon that, it is very difficult for a Muslim to be um, really supporting somebody like that. It would be like supporting Dajjal, like, you know, the Antichrist, like, or a false prophet or something like that, really, you know. The other, the other but, but what is confusing is that there really is a need for um, some of these issues uh, facing the African-American community to come to the open. And, and, and the problem of African-American men is a great problem uh, in terms of the pressure being put on by the society and the genocide that is clearly going on. Look at the prison system, look at drugs, look at what's going on in America. It's a definite genocide. And so um, the issue is an important issue that Muslims need to address. But I think you know, what, is, um, what has come forward um, from the leadership uh, of most of the Muslim groups that I know of, the leadership position basically um, is not really to support uh, openly um, the demonstration, but at the same time, we're not bashing it. We're not going on TV and talking against people because that's what the system wants. They want people to be fighting each other publicly and a lot of confusion like that. So really, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you to support something um, you know, with the presence of, of a man who said Allah is a man. Can't do it. Can I just ask a yeah. question to follow up on, on that? Uh, what our uh, the Muslim leaders do is towards a, a brother of our country? I mean, is, is leaving him alone, getting complaints? Well, Minister Farrakhan actually, um, those who know him, is, 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 is a, uh, okay, the question is, what is the Muslim duty concerning Minister Farrakhan? And those, those who know him um, know that he is a highly intelligent person, and he is a well-read person. And actually, you may be surprised to know that between 19, after Elijah Muhammad died, to so around 1970, 75, so around 76, 77, he had entered Islam. He made Hajj to Mecca, Rabatat al-Alam al-Islami, Dr. Abdullah Nasif, personally came to Chicago, brought him to Mecca, he made the Hajj. He sat with Muhammad Qutb and other scholars in Mecca and other parts. People have come to him. Imam Siraj Wahaj knows him personally, he used to be his minister. He has gone to him personally. Brother Abdul Malik, who's in Orlando, was very close to him and knew him personally, spent time with him personally. But the reality is, he's making a choice, man. And like, you can't force anybody. La ikraha fi deen, qad tabayyin rushtu min al there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands clear from falsehood. So the message has been given to him very clearly. We, we, but, but we cannot say we don't ask Allah to guide him. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, prayed even for Abu Jahl. And he prayed for Umar ibn Khattab, who was at one point the enemy of Islam. He prayed for them to come into the faith, to strengthen Islam. So you can pray for the man and try to give him the message, and maybe Allah, inshallah, will open his heart. But in the present condition, we have to stand for the truth. And he is a man, we are all people, we die. And when we die, then our message is gone. But Islam will stay. So I, I, I want to look at the whole thing in a positive way. If African Americans and uh, Spanish Americans and Native Americans you know, are introduced to Islam by this, then eventually the truth has to come. If they see Islam as a positive force, then eventually, inshallah, if we do our job, the truth will come. Because Islam is going to stay and people will go. So try, you know, we have to try to be positive and upbeat and not feel depressed. Look at it positively. Really what is happening is, inshallah, it'll, it, it will eventually be a victory for Islam. Inshallah. 
If an Islamic conflict come and you have to go to the court to solve it, non-Muslim judge, do you have any other ways to solve the conflict? Now, um, this is a very difficult situation because we are not in a Muslim country. And so therefore, really, you cannot establish an Islamic court properly unless you have authority in the land. You have to have Sultan. If you don't have Sultan, you cannot really establish an Islamic court and make the hudud, the punishments of Islam, unless you really have power in the land. So we, we are in a weak position in this part of the world in terms of law. But what we try to do, what we are trying to do, is to have a council of imams or have councils where all the masjids are involved in the council and then people in the community can raise their problems to the council and make an Islamic tribunal and we try to solve some of the problems within our own community. We in Toronto, we have, we have a serious problem too in a masjid, people are in court in Toronto. And it's bigger than the one you got. So this, it's a problem all over the place. And um, you know, we, we have to try as best as we can you know, to be humble with each other and with Islamic uh, uh, sources and to try to solve it amongst ourselves. It says if, if the Islamic religion was the global, during, global religion during the Dark Ages, then why does history not record it? Why are young people not taught these things in history class? Because history in this part of the world, we used to call it his story. It's not my story. History is taught in what they call a Eurocentric point of view. What that means is that your educational system, even in the university here, your educational system focuses on Europe. Greenwich Mean Time in London, not in Timbuktu, West Africa, is in London. Middle East, middle from where? Far East, far from where? You understand what I'm saying? So therefore, it is a Eurocentric point of view, and we need to have what we could call Mecca-centric. That our history is centers on our faith and it goes out from Mecca. So the way they write history, and I used to ask this question as a young child, Christopher Columbus discovers America, he comes to the shore, look at the picture of Chris, he comes on shore, and the people are standing there. And he talks to them in Spanish and saying, I conquer you, I control you, and they probably say, cool down, man, he drinks some water. <laughs> and they brought him on shore, cooled him out, and then he set to destroying them. Okay, but the history book said Christopher Columbus discovered America and the people are standing there. That's intellectual genocide. You destroy people. That is what has happened in the West in order to justify the system of oppression and racism established over the past 400 years. That is what we are, we are recognizing in this part of the world. And so people, are, we have to rewrite history and tell it from our point of view, Christopher Columbus was discovered in 1492. You understand that sentence? He was discovered because he was lost. He didn't know where he was, and when he got back to Spain, he couldn't describe properly where he had been. That is the reality. <coughs> Okay, some of these questions are a little bit off the topic. A little bit off the topic. I want to stay sort of close to the topic that we're dealing with. How do you recognize and then address um, when culture classes, clashes with Islam? That is done by understanding the sources of Islam. By being able go, to go back to the pure sources of Islam, understand Islam from Quran and Sunnah, right from the righteous scholars in the early generations. If you can understand Islam from that point of view, then you can look at your culture and see if your practice is a Hindu practice or a Christian practice or a Jewish practice or some other kind of practice. Then you can tell. But if you just base your Islam on what was done in your country, then it, this is where the confusion is. So you go back to the sources, then you will be able to tell and distinguish between what is Islam and what is not. What does a sincere Muslim uh, do when the community he lives in is divided and he is not agreeing with any of the both camps? Um, what should a Muslim do? In, in, in one tradition, um, as part of the tradition, it said that we should follow uh, the Amir, 
follow your leadership. And if there's no Amir, there's no leaders, then go away from all of the groups and hang on to your faith until Allah takes your life. That is an extreme position. But really, I think that we have to try to work with the communities, try to be positive, and support proper leadership. Support the people who are standing up for the issue according to the Quran and Sunnah in the proper way. If not, then we have to form the type of communities where this disunity does not exist. Okay, and each situation has got its own specifics to it. Each place, there's no straight answer to it. And this is one of the fitness that we are living in, that in many cases it's like a gray area. And it's hard sometimes to distinguish between one side or another. It says, is it a sin to miss your sunnah prayers? Okay, this is a little bit off the topic. But you know, you should try to do your sunnah as much as possible, all your salat, especially tatawa. That sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ did constantly, you should try to do it. But it is not fard. It is not something you will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for if you, uh, if you miss, because it's not fard. Okay, in terms of um, the family uh, situation, we had a forum yesterday dealing with the Muslim family. And um, it was a workshop, an interactive workshop. And uh, one of the brothers has, uh, has taped it. So I want to ask if it's possible for the brother, inshallah, to um, through the uh, MSA here and through MINA, if we can get this tape available, sure. then I would give you know, permission in terms of just, just send me a copy, but I give you permission to you know, sell it for, you know, for the, give it out, whatever you want to do. But let, let people get to the tape to get the information. Uh, also, we're asking um, the brothers and sisters of MINA and, and, and the MSA to also take the information points because the people brought out what are the problems facing youth and, and families, husband and wife, and then we brought some practical solutions to the problem. We want to bring this out and to make a position paper on the family that came out of the workshop, inshallah. Pride, what is the difference between pride and dignity? Dignity is when, in, in English, if you're proud of your origins, it means that you're not ashamed. It means that you say, this is where I am. You're not ashamed of your color. You're not ashamed of your, uh, uh, your appearance. You're not ashamed of your language. You're not ashamed of your family. You're not ashamed of your religion. Okay, that's pr proud in the sense of, that's dignity in a sense. This is like you're, you're dignified. But pride and takabbur and the arrogance that I'm talking about is when you look down on other people based upon how Allah created you based on some, some of this material, artificial means, you're looking down on everybody else, and you think you're better than everybody else based upon these things. That is the, 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 the kibriya takabbur uh, type of thing that I was talking about in that area. So I, I would like to conclude um, uh, by saying that if um, anything um, was offensive to you, then I ask Allah to forgive me. If you have learned anything, then that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not from me. And I end subhanakallahum bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaqfuruk wa natubu ilayk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal as inna al insana la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasu bil haq wa tawasu bil sabr. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum.